Okay. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this special Yoma Shoah event with Miami Beach JCC. And uh, my name is Danny Reed. I'm the Director of Cultural Arts and Adult Programs here at the JCC. And uh, I want to welcome you all for coming. We have a very special program with two very dear friends of mine today. Um, first, we have Dr. Miriam Klein Kasanoff and Miriam Wave. And Miriam is the director of the Holocaust Institute, uh, which is connected with the University of Miami. And also she is the, the curriculum supervisor on Holocaust for Miami-Dade County Public School System and um, education co-chair at uh, the Holocaust Memorial. And she's very involved with the JCC. She's uh, chair of the JCCU committee as well. So Miriam, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us today. And um, also my good friend, Laszlo Selly. Laszlo is a uh, retired commercial photographer and currently uh, an amazing, uh, I, I, would say, I would call you a professional photographer. The work you, that you do is, is amazing. But uh, if you ever wanna know any good advertising tricks for, uh, for taking pictures, Laszlo's your man. Um, but uh, both are Holocaust survivors and they both have uh, amazing stories to tell. And thank you all once again for joining us. And, uh, and uh, Laszlo and Miriam, thank you for sharing your stories with us today. I know that uh, it is, uh, uh, can be difficult and it's, a, it's an emotional experience uh, for both of you, no matter how many times um, you've told the story. So what we're gonna do, ladies and gentlemen, is just gonna go back and forth a little bit between each of, uh, of their experiences, because they, although they have very different stories, they um, experiences they they run in parallel uh, in certain ways, and um, so we're gonna we're going to uh, learn a little bit about them. We have some visuals as well that will help us, and um, also at the end there will be time for uh, for questions. If anybody has, I just ask that uh, you put the questions in the chat. So. Um, why don't we first begin by, uh, if you, each of you may start with Miriam, if each of you can please just uh, uh, introduce yourself and just say where um, you are from uh, in, uh, in Europe, like where were you born? Hello, everybody. I see a lot of my friends out there. A special shout out to Eva Moremi, who's from Czechoslovakia. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to be here today. And it's my honor to be co-presenting with my dear friend, fellow child survivor, um, Laszlo. And of course, working with Danny, it's always a pleasure. So you know who I am. Danny just gave you a big introduction. Uh, what you don't know, many of the Miami people, is that I was born in Czechoslovakia in a city called Kasia or Kasia, K-A-S-S-A. And in 1939, the Nazis came into Czechoslovakia, occupied it, and at that time took all the leading Jewish men from our community and took them to a forced Nazi operated Hungarian fascist labor camp. It was the precursor to the concentration camp. So my story begins when I was just a small child and uh, I was about Four when all this started and in front of my eyes on a Shabbat evening, my father, uh, who was a rab rabbinical a rabbi, um, was taken out of our home and I thought I would never see him again, but he escaped and then my journey continues from there. I can't hear you, Danny, because you're muted. Danny? Yeah, sorry, there was some background noise, so I muted. Um, Lazo, and, and you, if you can just introduce yourself, where are you from? And uh... Okay, my name is Laszlo Sally, and I was born in Budapest, Hungary. But my name was not always Sally. 
when I was born, my name was Schwartz. And my father changed the family name after the Holocaust because anti-Semitism was still running rampant in Hungary. And he felt that my twin brother and I would have a better chance in life not advertising our Jewishness by our name. So, by the way, Laszlo, all these years that we've been working together, I never realized that your real name is Schwartz, and that's my mother's maiden name from Hungary, was also Schwartz. We might be relatives and don't wow. even know it. Wouldn't that be interesting and nice? <laughs> you know, that would be very interesting. You know, the, the, the game of Jewish geography uh, never, never stops, but uh, yeah. that, that would be something. That is very, very something. Um, well, we'll have to look into that. Well, yes, I know, we you definitely, will. We'll have to you definitely explore would. It. So, so you each, you know, were were very young when uh, when uh, uh, the war started and when um, uh, the Nazis invaded. And of course, Hungary was an ally of uh, of Nazi Germany. Um, so, and you know, Lazo, you have a little bit of different experiences. Uh, of when it really, really started or, or began for you, but when you felt it. But, you know, Miriam, it seems from what you said is that you and your family, and even though you were only four, you're, you're, you still have memories of, of the impact being felt almost uh, immediately. Yeah, I think that one of the things that the world uh, doesn't know when they're studying or learning about the Holocaust is that there were two or three generations of survivors. There was the older generation who unfortunately uh, went to the death camps and the ghettos. But then there's this last generation that is being called upon so much right now, and that would be Laszlo and me. So we are called child survivors of the Holocaust in that we were probably under the age of 10 or 11 and um, we were either hidden uh, by Catholics and or we were hidden by farmers or in Laszlo's case, which he will tell you, he was in open hiding in a, a particular kind of Jew house in Budapest. And in my case, which is very unique, we were in open hiding on the run throughout Eastern Europe, destined to try to get to Lisbon, Portugal for safety. So one last comment before I talk about that journey about child survivors. Our memories are very fragmented and they have holes in it so that when we tell our story, it's usually because we've researched and put together the research as well as our vague memories, which is what I've done basically. But we do have fragmented memories. So let's, if we can just go into that uh, a little bit, because you, you mentioned uh, that uh, one of those earliest memories that you have uh, is of your father being taken to a forced labor camp. Right. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what uh, what happened after that? And also what was from what you recall from piecing everything together? What was uh, how did the decision come about to try and, and leave? My father escaped the camp. It was possible to escape from a slave labor camp particularly because a lot of the guardsmen were really just young boys from the local community. So if you told them some kind of a bubba mindset, like I'm gonna leave and come back with a lot of money for you, they would buy it. They were naive, thank God. And that's what my dad said. He said, uh, you know what? We have a lot of money and I remember you from Kasha and if you let me go home for the weekend, I'll come back with a lot of money for you. So he got out, he escaped. 
when he came home, he told my mother that he had already prepared visa papers with another aunt that lived in uh, Chicago that had left before the war from Europe. And that if we didn't leave immediately, that he would be caught again, taken back, and that he had heard in the camps that all the Jews of Europe were going to eventually be murdered. So the determination to leave had already been set by my dad before he was taken. And in December, he escaped in, in December, 1940. And in December, 1940, we went to last visit to my mother's twin sister to try to get her and her family to go with us. She said no. She would take her chances and stay. And uh, that's why so many stayed and we left. And we began this journey of going through um, Slovakia, Hungary, Yugoslavia, Italy, France, Spain, to Portugal. Just the four of us alone, by ourselves, on trains, on foot, on carriage, uh, until we finally arrived in Portugal in 1941. You know, it's interesting that, that your father believed and had maybe even the foresight. I've always thought about this because so many, so many people didn't believe it. You know, I always think of Knight and Elie Wiesel and, you know, he was deported in 1944 after years of rumors, after people even escaping and telling, going back to his town and telling, you know, the people what was happening. And yet, I recall reading that people on the train didn't believe. Well, if you knew my father, he was like that when we arrived in Miami, uh, when we were, when he was alive here. Um, he was a pessimist, to be honest with you. And uh, as Michael Berenbaum, the scholar, has said, the pessimists uh, left, the optimists stayed, the optimists died and were murdered, and the pessimists knew what they were doing. That was my dad. If there was a storm coming, my dad was going to figure out a way to get around it. So that's a very interesting point. And uh, it's an incredible story that I'll be telling in detail at Temple Beth Shalom Friday night at six o'clock. So if you want to hear the whole story in detail, I invite all of you to come. So, Meanwhile, I met Lajlo, who I've discovered at the same time that I was going through this journey of escape, he was in a different situation. Yeah. Because it's interesting because at the same time that, you know, this is happening to you, you know, Lazo, you're, you're having a, a different experience. I mean, did you, um, you know, in those, those early years of the war, do you remember, uh, um, I guess, the impact of the, the fascists and the Arrow Cross on, on your life and the life of your family? Well, my, my Holocaust really started the, uh, um, with my mother uh, sewing yellow stars on our clothes because the law was that all Jews, regardless of age, have to wear a yellow star on their clothes. So when we went out on the street, everybody could uh, clearly see there goes a lousy, filthy Jew. But Hungary uh, didn't really have uh, a very long Holocaust, because as you said earlier, uh, the Hungary was on the side of the Germans and the Hungarian army fought with the German army. So the Nazis, uh, the Germans did not occupy Hungary until quite late in the Holocaust. And the persecution and the deportation of the Jews started really when the Nazis uh, came into Hungary. And, uh, you know, that there, there was discrimination before and, and uh, had to wear the yellow stars before, and, and, but uh, we were not deported uh, to, to Auschwitz. 
the deportations really started when the German army occupied Hungary. Were you still, you know, despite having to wear the, the armband, were you still allowed to, to go to the same schools as, as uh, Christian Hungarians, shop at the same stores, all of those things? Well, I was at that time, I was uh, not allowed to go to school. I, I do not remember going to school at all until after the Holocaust. And uh, uh, so we were not uh, allowed mm -hmm. to go to school. And uh, later on when the deportations started, by that time, somehow word have leaked out from the camps, from people who escaped. And, and uh, so my parents knew that going to the camps uh, was a death sentence. But uh, we had really no choice uh, in, in that matter because we had to move into uh, not really a ghetto because the Budapest ghetto was quite small. But what they did is they had designated Jewish houses and they painted the yellow star on the front gate and Jews had to move in there and three, four, five families to a small apartment, which of course became unbelievably crowded, unbelievably dirty and smelly and, and uh, living conditions were just horrible. Can you, can you uh, just go back for a moment, uh, Laszlo, and can you um, uh, tell everyone what happened with your father's uh, uh, work? Well, when the Nuremberg laws uh, were enacted, uh, then Jews could not own businesses. And my father had a little shop. He worked with maybe three, four people and he could no longer own that. So he handed the business over to one of his old and trusted employees. The man took the business and immediately fired my father, stating that he will not employ Jews. So there went the family income. You know, the Jew employed him for, for many years and gave him bread to take home to his family, but he was a very good Nazi and, and uh, he would not employ Jews. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I assume that, you know, I mean, that's a similar story that probably happened all over, uh, all over the country too. Um, I do want to get back to, to, uh, to Miriam for a moment. Um, because, you know, uh, Miriam, so you, you, your family makes the decision to, to go and your father already has some of the paperwork. Um, you know, I, I think we would all like to hear a little bit more of this, of, you know, at least a little bit of the story of how, you know, from what you remember journeying from country to country, but, you know, for those who don't understand, um, can you, can you explain a little bit about what paperwork actually entails back then well, to, uh, to uh, go? Yeah, you know, uh, as I've been watching TV and the Ukrainian children and families running across borders, um, you had to have back in 1940s during the war, during the Holocaust, you had to have visa stamp for each country and the not in our case, just as we'd be fleeing from one country into the next, the Nazis were right on our heels. They were occupying that country just as we would leave. Someone from Yad Vashem once said, I should call my talk dancing between the raindrops. And um, there were a lot that you had to go through to get from border to border. And we managed until we got to Spain. Although Spain was not particularly Nazi occupied, they were very empathetic towards the Nazis. And they had border guards, again, who were very anti-Semitic and many times would stop the Jews who were fleeing and even send them back. But my father had a lot of money on him and he kept bribing. And when we got to Spain, 
which was already now uh, January 1941. So we had been on the road for December, January, about a month, six weeks. We had to get to Portugal by April for a ship that we had reserved. And so um, we got arrested actually in Spain. The border guards turned us in and they put us into a hotel until they could decide what to do with us. But my dad met a very sympathetic uh, Christian non-Nazi German who helped my dad write a letter to the Lisbon Jewish community. And somehow or other from there, we got out, finally arrived in Lisbon only to miss our ship because we didn't have our visa ready. It had expired. So it was not easy. It was not an easy thing to do. Many times uh, my mom and dad told me later in life that they just wanted to turn back and go back to Slovakia where we would have surely been murdered because six months later, all the Jews were being murdered already. Or the saddest thing I ever heard was that my mother said that um, she would have gladly given me and my younger brother, Ted, um, away to somebody just to make us live. And that saddened me a great deal because I wouldn't have grown up to be Sarah and Maurice Klein's daughter. So our journey was very, very difficult and I will end it after Laszlo speaks. <laughs> okay. You know, I, it's funny that, you, it's, that your parents thought along those lines as well uh, to try and hide you, as so many parents were doing, and and Laz, like, you know, maybe this is a good part for you because at some point, you know, your parents tried to do the same for you and your brother. Can you speak a little bit about that? Well, yes. When the uh, deportations uh, started in in Hungary, uh, my parents were very much afraid that uh, my twin brother and I would wind up, uh, of course, with them in one of these transports, and and he knew that uh, that would be a death sentence for us but we had this this aunt and really she was not an aunt she was just a family friend she wasn't jewish and she was the member of the nazi party and she walked around with uh, the armband of the swastika and if i remember correctly she had a gun on her hip and she came to us one day and uh, told my parents that she will take my twin brother and me to her place to live with her to see if she could uh, save us. And uh, we had no choice in the matter. We had to go with her. Of course, we were given new names because Schwartz wouldn't do. That was too Jewish. And we were warned never ever to tell anybody our real name. So just imagine us little kids, we had to learn a different name. And uh, that's not easy. We were terrified uh, that we will forget this name and then what? Uh, uh, but, but we went with her and she, she had a little tobacco shop, a little hole in the wall. And, and she lived behind this shop in a dark, dingy room. There wasn't even a door between the shop and her room, just a curtain. And that's where we went to live. But interestingly enough, she had this young woman working for her. And this young woman became very suspicious. And she kept asking my brother and me for our real name. And we would not tell her. Until one day when she came to me with a little piece of candy. And she told me I can have this candy if I tell her my real name. And, and guys, let me tell you, I, I wanted that candy real bad. <laughs> and I, I was a little kid, huh? you know, what did I know? All I knew, I, I wanted this candy. I haven't seen candy for, for months. And of course, I, I told her. And my aunt overheard this from behind the curtain, ran out like a mad woman, threw the girl out of there, and within five minutes, we were on our way back to the designated Jewish house to our parents and perhaps to wait 
for the deportations. And let me tell you why. It was punishable by death to hide a Jew. If the Nazis had found out that she is hiding two Jewish children, uh, they would shoot her on the spot. There would be no trial, no lawyer, no judge, just stand up against the wall and they, they shoot her. And of course, they would shoot the Jew also, whether he's a kid or otherwise, didn't matter. So we had to get back to the uh, Yellow Star house. But, how, how, yeah. um, how during this time, you know, actually I'm gonna hold off on that question. You know, I wanna go back to Miriam. But Miriam, why don't we, can we share, uh, why don't we share a screen and show a little bit uh, as you finish your story? Uh, yeah, can sure. Share your screen for a few minutes. Um, so I'm gonna show you all some pictures that I do when I teach about this to my students and teachers in the Dade County Schools. So for many of you in Miami, you might have remembered my dad, the late Rabbi Maurice Klein, and that was my mom, the late Sarah Klein, and there's my brother, the late federal judge, Ted Klein, and that picture is the last teacher institute. My mother came to every single one. She died at the age of 99, and I'm the only one left now of the family that escaped together. Um, you want to move to the next one? Um, so right there, uh, my mother was a twin. You can't tell the difference. I even can't tell the difference. And it's the twin, Lily, that died in Auschwitz, we found out eventually. I think we, we, we're almost sure she died in Auschwitz. We never found her again and her family the one that wouldn't come with us. Uh, let's go to a couple more and then. So this is my record of arrival that I found. Um, there's my father, Moritz. They gave, my mother's name and my name changed a lot of times during the journey. Um, my mother was Sarah, here she's Sally, I was Marika. I was changed to Maria, I was changed to Mary. And finally, when I arrived in America, my dad just said her name is Miriam. And Ted's original name was Tibor, which is the Hungarian uh, for uh, Ted. And that's the synagogue that sponsored us in Chicago. Chicago. You couldn't get here unless you had a sponsor. You know, it just, I mean, this is uh, one small piece of your, uh, you know, I was mentioning the paperwork earlier of just, you know, and just how you moved across Europe with uh, entry yeah. visas, exit visas. And... I just want you to show the picture of what I look like when I left, because a lot of people don't realize that small children, they're just like the children who are leaving Ukraine now. That's what I look like right before we left. <laughs> And um, my mother managed to grab all these pictures, shoved them into a suitcase along with some jewelry. I'm wearing one of the pieces here. I always wear it close to my heart. And uh, that's how we have these documents, uh, just like the Ukrainians that you watch with their suitcases. You wonder what's in those suitcases. This is what's in those suitcases. They grab their documents. They they grab their jewelry, they grab their precious pictures. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, I want to ask you if you can talk about this, because I see this picture of you as, you know, like a, a four year old uh, little girl. And, um, you know, one of the things that happened to you, I think it was when you were in Spain waiting for the exit and exit visas from Spain and entry visas into Portugal, that your your parents had to uh, had to leave you for a while. In Portugal, they did not allow Jews to actually live in Lisbon. I just discovered on my trip back to Lisbon, but they did allow us to live in pensions about 15 miles outside of the city. And so 
yeah, my mother and father had to go into Lisbon every day to get new visa papers, to get on the right ship, to come to America. So they left me holding my baby brother. And uh, today that would be unheard of. But, you know, in those days it was different and uh, hard to believe, but she would knock on the door of the neighbor refugee next door and say, please take care of Marika and Tibor. I have to go with my husband to go get paperwork and stand in line. And it is hard to believe, but those were the kind of things you did during wartime. You know, your, you know, your, your father was a rabbi and your, your, your mother, they seem like very refined, educated people. Did they speak multiple languages? Yes, my father spoke six languages. What did he speak? Uh, I have a combination in my head of Yiddish, Hebrew, Hungarian, uh, and English. My dad spoke all those languages. He learned English on the ship. For many of you here in Miami, he ultimately was uh, an assistant rabbi at Temple Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. And I became the Holocaust educator for the Dade County Public Schools, which I still do. Uh, I, would no spoke, I would assume he spoke German as well. That's like he a, did. He yeah. did. He spoke German, Czech, Hebrew, Yiddish, Hungarian. Uh, my mother only spoke Hungarian and a broken English. She went to uh, uh, John Hopkins uh, adult, is it not John Hopkins, Lindsay Hopkins adult education here to learn English. Um, and then Ted, the baby, grew up to be a federal judge. He graduated from Yale, University of Miami, Yale. And I have another brother who was born in America, Hank Klein, who is a businessman in the community. And this was Jewish life in Kashel before the war. That's the synagogue where my father was a rabbi and my grandfather as well. So this is it and today, you know, that's you... another picture before we left. Uh, my mother and my baby brother, that's what my mother slept through Europe, that little baby and myself. You know, it's, you know, yesterday, everyone, I was speaking with Miriam and I said that uh, she grew up in a, in a small town and uh, she said, oh, no, no, it's not a small town. It was a good, it was a good sized regional city. Yeah. And here I, I see that. Uh, Confirmed. It looks like a city. Yes, it was. It was. And today it's quite an important city. If you look at the map of uh, Ukraine that they show you on CNN, right to the left of Ukraine is Slovakia. And Kosice is often, if you look really closely on that map. Yeah, I see it. Okay. Wonderful. And then, ah, so here's pictures of forced labor, like a camp that you're, I guess, uh, Yad, Vashem your actually, uh, Yad Vashem actually found the camp that my father was in, wow. Sharash Patak. That's really something. Um, all right, we're going to, let's see, I want to switch to Laszlo because we're, we're leaving you, we're leaving you in Lisbon for the moment, uh, Miriam. Okay. And I want to go to Laszlo. So Laszlo, I want to, uh, if you don't mind, show this. But um, I also, I just wanted to, you know, we just saw a, uh, a picture of um, a map of Hungary. But uh, it's, it's good to also, when we're speaking about what um, the experiences that, that Miriam and Laszlo had, just to see what, here's a, a, a map of what Europe was uh, like in 1939. And um, and here is a map uh, showing the extent of uh, of the Nazi occupation of uh, of Europe at the extent and height of their uh, their powers, and you can see how much of Poland they annexed, and then there's the government, the, the central government, where they wanted to turn the Poles the Poles into um, into a slave labor population, and of course all the Jews 
in Eastern Europe, we uh, eventually uh, exterminate them. But this is what Laszlo was mentioning, the Arrow Cross Party. Uh, this was the uh, the Hungarian version of the of the Nazi Party, and um, went right along with everything. You know, especially after the Nazis occupied uh, Hungary in uh, in spring of forty four, went right along with it. Um, so before we show that, uh, where is okay, Lazo? Can we start with this? Because you're so yes, sure. <laughs> yes, that's that's me. What a beautiful baby you were, Laszlo. Look I, at the think still, I think I'm still beautiful. Where's the curly hair? Yeah. Well, let's not pick on that. <laughs> so I let me see if this is this is you and your and your brother, blessed memory. Yes. Um, yes. And you guys were twins as well. We were twins, yes. So how old are you in this picture? Oh my god. Uh, that picture, I must have been uh, four, four, maybe four three, five. four, something. Because so like we're 19... the same age right, yes. right now. Yeah. So this is 1940. <laughs> Let's see if there's anything. Here you are. Okay. So here you are in 1944. So I'm assuming this was taken just before, before just before the uh, Nazis, the German army occupied Hungary, so and about... this was taken in the Hungarian zoo. Right. You're about seven years old here. Yes. Okay. Yes. Six, so, seven, you know, six, seven years old. Right. So you, can you, can we go back? So, you know, after, um, after uh, your aunt. After, after my aunt, uh, what happened is that my father got a hold of some papers by uh, Raoul Wallenberg, the Swedish uh, diplomat who were uh, trying to save uh, as many Hungarian Jews as he could. And uh, he took us out of the Yellow Star house and took us over to another building uh, that uh, he had and uh, that had a little plaque saying this is Swedish diplomatic property in the hope that the Nazis would recognize that. But, but quite frankly, the Nazis didn't care whether you were a Hungarian Jew or Romanian Jew or Swedish Jew or any other kind of Jew. It made no, no difference to them. So by this time, Budapest is really under siege by the Soviet army. And as the Soviets come up from the east, the Allies are fighting the Germans from the west. Uh, the Germans kind of knew that the war was hopeless and uh, the deportations to Auschwitz stopped. Uh, but the killing of the Jews in Budapest didn't. It was not taken over by the, uh, the Hungarian uh, Nazi party, the Aerocross. And uh, they took the people out of these houses, including the Swedish protected houses, and they marched them down to the river Danube, and, uh, which is a beautiful wide river running through the center of Budapest. They lined them up on uh, the banks of the river and executed them. And the building they were in was right at that spot where this happened. You can see on the, uh, the massacre site and the site of the international ghetto in the upper right uh, of the uh, thing. And, and uh, this is where our building was, right at the edge of this, this place. And, and uh, mercifully, we could not see these executions took place every morning. And, uh, but we could clearly, clearly hear it. And, and we heard the cries and the screams of the people as they realized what was about to happen. And we heard the, the orders being shouted. And we heard the machine gun fire. And we, then we all just sat there and listened uh, to the silence and we knew that all these people were dead. We saw them being marched right under our window every, every morning. And uh, that, that was 
very, very difficult to hear. So, but at the same time, if I'm not mistaken, the Soviets are, are you know, battling, the, you know, trying the to- The Soviets are battling the already on the outskirts, on the outskirts of, of uh, Budapest. Mm -hmm. uh, they were fighting from street to street and house to house, practically. Mm -hmm. And if you look at uh, the news today, and you see the destroyed cities in the Ukraine, that is exactly how Budapest looked like right. at that time. And, well, you know, while we at it, let me take a second to, to just say that uh, my thoughts go out to the children yeah. of Ukraine, because I lived through it, so I know their terror and their fright and, and their pain. And, and I need to ask, have we not learned anything from the past? Don't we know yet that the scars of war is uh, a wound that will never heal? And now yeah. a whole generation of children will have to grow up uh, mourning their, their fathers and their brothers and their loved ones for a useless and unnecessary war. And just to finish this thought up, my heart is, is full of fear, sorrow, and fury. Well, you know, I, I, I used to think that, the, that we had gone past the age of the dictator saying, oh, I want that territory, army, go get it. And, and I know I'm, very, I'm really simplifying uh, what's happening, but in essence, but when you boil it down, that's basically- That's exactly, that's exactly what's happening. You know, a, 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 an autocrat saying, I want that piece of territory. So, and ordering their army to take it. Uh, I agree with uh, Laszlo. Yeah. We talked about this a lot. We spent a lot of time together and I sometimes say, what am I doing? What am I doing with my work? When I have to see, I mean, we teach, don't be a bystander. Don't let this happen again, never again, and yet ever again. I and I... it's very disheartening. It's very disheartening. So I agree with Lajo, and that's why I wrote the poem that I wrote, Ode to the Ukrainian Children, uh, because I just don't understand. Why is this happening again? And why aren't we doing more to stop it? You know, I, I would say this, though. I think that, you know, from what I, from what I see, you know, you're, you're both are right. You know, why is this happening yet? But on the other hand, I think the reaction of a lot of the, the world, the amount of organizations that are there helping. Um, Poland and Romania, and I think even Germany is letting uh, refugees in. That might not necessarily have happened, you know, a few decades ago. Um, well, it didn't happen. What we it oh, didn't happen, right. but but there wasn't TV and CNN. Correct. Correct. You know, social media and television yeah. can be horrible in some instances, yeah. but in this instance, it has helped a great deal. Yeah. Just I mean, think, yeah. if if we would have had CNN. Uh, in the 1940s, watching Jews being marched into uh, gas chambers, I would hope that that, <laughs> that might would have, have it might have been different. Um, you know, I, I would also say this: we're, you know, we're not putting boots on the ground to stop Putin, but I think the military assistance that we are giving the Ukraine the Ukrainians has helped them stop or or, or fight to a stalemate. At least it seems. The, the Russian army. Um, so that is that is something I would say. But uh, but yes, you know, it is very disheartening to see that a, dic a dictator, an autocrat, can still, you know, uh, make war, like we're seeing uh, the Russians the Russians make war. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I and I also say that uh, that that you being here and you you continuing to teach and uh, especially the youth makes a difference. It makes a difference, you know? Um, 
you know, Laza, where I'm, I'm giving the punchline, the, the spoiler to the end of your story, but, you know, I'm happy the Soviets took over the block that your apartment building was on, uh, that, uh, that you could survive. And I'm glad that uh, your parents, Miriam, managed to get the ticket to, uh, to get out of uh, Lisbon. I, you know, I wonder what would have happened if you had never managed to, uh, to get the ticket for the, for the ship, you know. I tell you what would have happened. We would have been dead. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Same thing with us, yeah. Right. Do you, Miriam, do you remember, well, uh, well, two things. Laszlo, let's ask you. I want to ask, Laszlo, if you remember the day um, the, the Soviet army soldiers knocked on the door of the apartment? Yes. I will, never, I, will never, I will never forget that because that was the day that the uh, Nazis, the Arrow Cross, uh, came to our uh, building and they told us uh, that tomorrow morning we all have to be lined up in front of the building and, and we knew where we were going and we knew why. And, uh, you know, that was the most horrible night I, I have ever spent in my life. But very early that morning, you know, we heard the uh, rifle butts banging on the front door. And of course, the door had to be opened up. And there stood two Soviet soldiers with their submachine guns looking for Germans. Because the Soviet army took the street that we lived on that night. And of course, had there been only one day late, I would not be here today to tell you the story. Well, we're, we're glad you're here. <laughs> well, say the thank you. So, say so the am I. So am I. <laughs> Miriam, I, I wanted to ask you, like, do you remember that moment when uh, uh, your your parents or your father came home with with the tickets in hand, knowing that you would be able to get out of, uh, of Europe? Yeah, there are visions I have that I remember. Um, the first memory is when they took my father away. Right. The second was when he came home and in Hungarian, I heard him say to my mother, we have to go. Uh -huh. The third memory is going to see my aunt Lily and my mother begging her, please, we'll figure out a way to get you tickets. Come along with us. And my aunt Lily saying, what will happen to me here will happen to you on the road. I'm not going. And I think of her so often. I would love to have gotten to know her. I would love, sometimes I have this fantasy that she's alive and that I'm walking down the street in Miami and there's this woman that looks like my mother and that it's my aunt. Um, and then I remember the journey uh, on the trains because we lost my dad at one point. He got on one train and we got on another at night. We couldn't, we lost each other. And I can still hear in my ears, my mother screaming, Maurice, where are you? Where are you? And I was so frightened that I'd lost my dad again. And then we found him. And then I remember uh, Lisbon uh, obviously taking care of the baby. And I remember the ship very well. I was telling some people last night, I've yet to take a cruise. I don't even want to look at water, <laughs> but, um, You've never been on a cruise? Well, not a major one. I took uh -huh. a weekend one, but I'm going to try to book one in the summer. <laughs> Cause I really wanted to sit on a deck and read and get away from it all. Right. But I do remember arriving in America and going to school as a Jewish refugee child in the weirdest refugee clothes. I never felt like I was an American teenager child or anything. I always felt like I was different. I still do. And I am different. And so is Lajo. We're immigrant children from the Holocaust. We were not raised American style. I, I'm speaking for you, Laszlo, but I would guess- Perfectly that, okay, because it's true. Yeah, I mean, I never had a little doll. I never was taken for play dates. 
my whole life from age five through uh, 12 was just adjusting to this country, learning the language of English and comparing my parents and how they lived immigrant wise to the typical, I lived in Cleveland, Ohio, where there were very wealthy Jewish people in Shaker Heights. And the mothers just all looked so different from my mother. But everybody liked to come to my house the most because it was the warmest welcoming home. So those are the fragments of memory of a right. child survivor. And those are the kind of memories that Lazo referred to that I believe the Ukrainian children will have. Right. I hope some of them grow up to be and do what I'm doing, teach about their experience. And once again, preach never again, but I do have a little issue with that. So I, I would hope, uh, I would hope, by the way, uh, we do have a few minutes left, ladies and gentlemen, if anybody has a, a question, please type it in the chat. Um, and, and, uh, by, uh, you know, by the way, everyone, and this is, would be a topic just for a separate meeting, but but Laszlo, um, you know, I think even you know after the war ended and your 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 family survived. I know you had family members that did uh, die in the Holocaust, but your immediate family survived. But then you um, spent the next uh, what uh, eleven years, twelve yeah, years. Twelve years, right? Uh, well, right. Hungary became a communist uh, country. Correct. And. Uh, I live behind the Iron Curtain and, and uh, under communist rule after that, until we were able to escape in 1956. Right. And uh, so I had, uh, I had uh, that experience also living under communism. And uh, I can talk hours about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, but, you, know, you know, you know, firsthand, you know, so. Uh... Uh, you know, but, if we have a few seconds, uh, uh, then I can just tell you what those children in Ukraine are feeling sitting in the dark or uh, dingy basement with uh, no light at all, or maybe just uh, a flickering candle, which is even worse, tell you honestly, than light, because the shadows that candles cast are frightening. And to sit there and listen to the explosions coming closer and, or uh, going away from you, uh, and and uh, listening to that is is a very frightening, very frightening experience for a child. I have a question. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, Danny. Um, yes. Can you extend this a little bit longer? Sure. Is there are some questions There's that I think questions are, here. are worthy um, to answer? Right. I have a well, question. There's one question here. If everybody can just put their questions in the chat, though, please. Um, uh, there's one question here, uh, Miriam and Laszlo. How much of your fears and sounds, etc., were passed passively to your children, despite attempts to do otherwise? Um, you want me? I'll answer that first. Yeah. Um, so evidently, my children are fine. Uh, I would say it's more my mother's fears that were passed on to me. I'm afraid of dogs. I'm afraid of darkness. I don't go out very much at night. Um, I'm afraid of everything. People don't know that about me because I come across a very strong lady with the work that I do, but I have a tremendous amount of fears. And uh, I never learned to swim. I'm scared of the water because my mother wouldn't let me go into deep water. Um, so it's reverse. My children are fine. In fact, my daughter once sat in a group of second generations and she told the group that she never saw me as anything but American. You see, I have no accent or anything. But it was her grandma, my mother, that had the impact on her. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's that. Uh, and that answers this other question I just saw about post-traumatic syndrome, is that we child, I don't want to speak for Laszlo, but from the studies I've done and the work I do with, there's plenty of it out there on child survivors. Oh, we have 
tremendous post-traumatic syndrome. Our fears, our remembrances, uh, as Lajlov says, being in darkness and cellars like the Ukrainian children. Um, <coughs> sure, you can't get through the Holocaust years or the years of running and hiding or being a refugee, uh, as with any country, really, without having post-traumatic syndrome. I have a question. Can you hear me? Hold, hold on one second. I just want to see if Laszlo wanted to tackle that uh, that question as well. Well, just very briefly, I have stepsons. I don't have children of my own, and I have grandchildren, and they're mine. Uh, but uh, so I, I did not uh, pass my fears on to to anybody and that might be a good uh, thing. And uh, I don't think I have fears anymore. I have anger, tremendous anger, <laughs> but no fear. Thank you. Who's and that's why uh, Laszlo and I get along so well because I express my fears to him and he always assuages me and says, oh, don't worry about that. <laughs> so it's really interesting our parallel lives and how we both and we're the same age came out a different way right somebody i i again if anybody has any questions uh you yeah. can put them in the chat but somebody who is speaking yes. i have a question billy yes um Go ahead. i i came to the united states uh from poland through germany uh, when I was 10 years old in 1948, and we also lived in Shaker Heights eventually. Uh -huh. I'm very interested. What is, I'm sorry, your whole name? What was your so, name? Who is speaking, Danny? I can't uh, see. Her name is Millie Selinger. Yes. I was so, Millie. Uh, I grew up in Cleveland Heights, Ohio. My father was a rabbi at Temple on the Heights. And I believe I was in Cleveland in 1948. I went to the Hebrew Academy of Cleveland and I went to Cleveland Heights High School. So uh, we can share geography by getting my email and we can talk privately about that. Uh, okay. Danny, I wanna give a plug to everyone here. Tamar Simon is on, she is the distributor of a fabulous film that's going to be coming out in Miami in the fall called uh, Three Minutes, A Lengthening. And it's an incredible documentary showing uh, life from a small shtetl in Poland through a camera lens. That's the only thing I can say right now to describe it. Please lo be looking for that film, everyone. It, it's, it's going to be outstanding. What's the name Are there of any... again, Miriam? Three minutes a lengthening. Okay, we'll keep on the lookout. You know, yeah. <clears throat> um, I, I, I'm sure you know, and maybe Laszlo, you know that the, the, there are studies that show that trauma can be passed down, can be inherited. Oh, yes. So like, you know, you know one of the active organizations at least one well, a few cities and also in uh, in Miami is 3G, mm -hmm. which is the yes. third generation, you know, grandchildren of, of Holocaust survivors. And there's even studies that are looking at, at that generation as well uh, to see to see how. So the whole the whole thing is very uh, look, it's it's very, very interesting, but also it's um, I think with survivors, it always seems to me it's how you channel that the angst or the or the PTSD or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, uh, you know, Laszlo, you're an extremely talented, uh, you know, photographer, and you're you're speaking. You know, the last few years you've been speaking tremendously uh, about your experiences. And Miriam, you went through, through education, so. Um, but then, can I interrupt for yeah. a second and tell yes. you that you are the one who is responsible for me speaking? That's because the first, true. the first time I met you on the March of the Living Four mm -hmm. some years ago, before that, I have not 
spoken about this mm -hmm. at all at to all. anybody, not even my wife. Right. So you were the one who brought me out of my shell mm -hmm. and made me talk. Well, you, you could have said no, you know, and, and, and it's true. A lot of a lot of survivors don't speak about it, um, you know, but it's also interesting that a lot of survivors are also very successful business people. Unfortunately, I'm not one of those. <laughs> yeah, but but you also have to remember, Danny and Lizzo and everyone that right. until recently, we child survivors were not even considered survivors. Right. So the reluctance to talk is for that reason that if you're not even considered or given the credibility of being a survivor, then you don't want to put yourself out there. Now, I did. I did because right. I knew darn well what I had gone through, even though I was a small child. And I got criticized a lot in the early years oh she's not a survivor she just says so why would i say so i don't know right. uh certainly didn't make me rich to do that and uh finally finally uh the claims conference and the united states holocaust memorial people gave a definition that a survivor of the holocaust is anyone whose life was drastically changed or had to escape Nazi Europe uh, between the eight years of 1933, 1945, no matter what the circumstances. Right. So, um, so many, there's a lot of child survivors out there who still say, I don't feel like I'm a survivor, so I'm afraid to speak. I don't right. want to talk. I don't want to be criticized. I mean, when we put ourselves out there, we are really opening ourselves up for a great deal of criticism and questioning as to our memories and what we really remember and did we really suffer that much. Sad to say, but let me put it to you straight that there has been that culture out there. And I and you know that, Danny. Right. No, I know. And I know there's a, there's a how would I put it? A, a hierarchy. There has been, I think it's hierarchy less than that, of a suffering. hierarchy of survivors. So um, of suffering. Of suffering. Yeah. Right. And and that and and believe me, I my heart goes out to the older survivors that had to go through Auschwitz. Right. I would never have made it or a ghetto. There's definitely a difference in our experience. Right. Not in our suffering, but in our experience. I don't think there is such a thing as little suffering or more suffering. It's just suffering. Yes, oh, Lasso, you uh, always and... say it so well. You're absolutely right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. May I quote you in the future? Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Well, listen, I, I, I want to thank you both. And just one last comment. Tamara, Simon. I uh, said, thank you, Miriam, and, Laz and uh, thank you, Lazo. Also, it's an honor to hear your story and Lazo's story for the first time. Um, and it's an honor for all of us. Just also, she mentions that the film that you mentioned is called Three Minutes a Lengthening. Is, uh, and Danny, I should mention that Eva Maremi's book, Hidden Recipes, I highly recommend it. Her mother was in Auschwitz and actually found recipes. And Eva, who was born after the war in Czechoslovakia, put this book together of recipes. So I highly recommend that book also. Thank you, so Thank you to the audience and everyone for being here today. We appreciate it. A lot of my friends are there, Dina and Robin Collar and Tamar and a lot of people. Thank you for coming on and listening today. Well, thank you, everybody. And uh, tonight, uh, sundown starts uh, Yom HaShoah um, and all day tomorrow. So um, uh, please, uh, please take a moment to uh, remember all the those that died and uh, and all the survivors, too. I think it's important to to honor them and remember them yeah. uh, as well. Um, and to so, Norma Rosenfeld, who always comes on. And Sunday night, uh, Laszlo and I will be lighting candles at the Holocaust Memorial. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, Sunday night at 6 p.m. at the Holocaust Memorial is a um, 
is the uh, ceremony for uh, the for the community. And, uh, and, and Miriam, you mentioned that uh, Temple Beth Shalom in Miami Beach yeah, is um, having a special I'm, service Friday night. Friday night, I'll be telling my story in more detail. Uh, Temple Beth Shalom, six o'clock. Would love to see you there. Okay. Wonderful. I don't know. If it, I think it's going to be live streamed as well. I'll forward you the flyer and then you can send it to everybody. I think it's going to be live streamed. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can do that. I can do that. Okay. All right, everyone. Thank you so much. On Bye. Behalf of Miami Beach Bye. Bye. Everybody. See you Sunday, okay. Laszlo. Thank, thank you, Danny. Have a, have a wonderful day. Laszlo, thank, thank you. you. Miriam, as always, thank you so much. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. I have, can I have her email? Uh, I, yeah. I put my it's, email in the chat. Who's that? Uh, Millie. 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 Uh, my, you can email me and I'll... Uh, She'll, he'll send you my email. Yeah, it's Danny at mbjcc.org. Any, I don't see it. There it is, right there. Uh, I don't see it. I just put it it's in the a, chat. Oh, it's in it, chat. It was there momentarily. Can you put it back? Okay. Any. At MBJCC. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Good night. Bye, everybody. Thank you so bye much. Bye, bye Laszlo. Bye, bye Mary. Thank bye, you. Everybody. Thank you.